Good morning and welcome home Shiloh. Here are some important updates and events at Shiloh Church. We are excited to launch our new traditional service on September 15th at 10.30 a.m. in the historic chapel. Interested in learning more about Shiloh Church? We invite you to stay after service today for our new and prospective members meeting. All JAM and nursery volunteers are required to stay after service today for an official JAM training. Brunch, prizes, and childcare will be provided. Our youth Bible study kicks off today after service in the youth room at 1015. Our Rooted in Romans study begins Wednesday, September 11th at 6 p.m. In addition to the adult Romans study, kids can attend our kid classes on discerning truth and defending their faith. The next men's breakfast is September 14th at 9 a.m. Calling all youth. Join us for a fun night of laser tag on September 15th from 4 to 7 p.m. We will meet at the church and take the van. All youth who have not yet completed confirmation are invited to join this year's confirmation class. Classes will be held on Sundays during the contemporary service and begin on September 22nd. Welcome home. God is good. All the time. And all the time. Well, good morning. I'm excited to welcome those of you here in person. And if you're joining us online, a special welcome to you guys. A few just extra things to draw your attention to. Youth, that is all our sixth graders and up. So if you are now in sixth grade with the new school year, you get to join youth. So we invite you to stay after service today downstairs in the youth room. Also after service, that important jam and nursery volunteer training, our new members class, lots of things kicking off this fall. And our preschool trivia night, they are in need of more people to play. There are only three tables, which is uh, going to make for first, second, and third. Lots of bragging rights, but unfortunately, not a lot of uh, income and help and assistance for them. So that is on September 27th. We'd love to see everybody find a table, um, piece together some people. It's going to be a fun night. Uh, it's, for some people, it's the trivia. Some people, it's the food, and that's okay. So uh, put together a crew and join us on the 27th. And if you want more information about that, Becky, Lord. Lord will be happy to help you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer for today's service. Father, we're so thankful to be in your house today. We pray that you would just be in this place, be with the words that you've given Pastor Ken, that they would touch our hearts and open our minds to hear more of you and grow deeper in our faith. We pray that you would be with all of us, be with our children, our Bible studies, our trainings, and all the things that we're doing to just continue walking with you. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand up and take a second to greet one another today. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. Psalm 42. Hold me now in the hands I created in the heavens. Find me now where the grace runs as deep as your scars. You pulled me from the clay, set me on a rock, called me by your name, made my heart whole again, lifted up, and my knees know it's all for your glory, that I might stand with more reasons to sing than to fear you pulled me from the clay set me on a rock called me by your name made my heart whole again here I stand high and surrender Now and for 
good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. Psalm 86, verse 5. Your pleased and 
Draw near to me, redeem me, set me free because of my enemies. Psalm 69, 18. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. our nation has been shaped immensely by the western frontier and there are so many different ways that we remember and we uh, image and that we imagine in lots of uh, different styles about the western frontier it's even been applied as an image for the christian life i remember reading one writer that said the christian life is like being in a wild west town where jesus is the sheriff Christians are the good law-abiding citizens, and then you got that outlaw element that's around. And Jesus helps you deal with that. Now, that's not my favorite image, 
taken from the Western world when it comes to Christianity. I think a better image is that Christianity is like being on the Oregon Trail. We're a long ways from our destination, but our trail boss is Jesus. He's the one that leads us, and we are pilgrims along the way. You know, it was 2,000 miles, roughly, from Independence, Missouri, to the Willamette Valley in Oregon. And when the settlers took off on those wagon trains, they didn't know what they might face. Uh, the storms, bad weather, buffalo stampedes, rattlesnakes, hostile Indians, epidemics. By the time the Oregon Trail ceased to function, if you took a wagon train from Independence out to Oregon, you passed something like 34,000 graves along the way of those that did not make it to the end. But in our journey, we have a trail boss that can get us there. We have a pathfinder that leads the way, who has experienced it himself and can get us through the process. We know our destination because for a Christian, God's kingdom, his heavenly realms is our destination. We know who our leader is. Jesus, who came and tasted our life and lived and experienced even our death that he might provide for us. We know there are dangers along the way, but we know that he has the power to get us through. So let's look at one successful traveler along that Christian journey of life, a man whose nickname was Barnabas. Please stand as you're able as we begin with Acts chapter 4, verses 34 through 37. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite from Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the, the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. We first meet Barnabas as a giver. You know, we're not told a whole lot about his past life. In fact, it's typical of the apostles. We just know a little bit about them, a little here and there. We do know that he was a person named Joseph, that Barnabas was a nickname it was that idea that he was a huge encourager. He lifted people up. He gave them a good word. He helped them along the journey. He had positive things to influence in the lives of those around him to the point that it becomes his nickname. He's an early Christian convert, a Jew living on the eastern Mediterranean island of Cyprus, that big island that's off the west coast of Israel, it's south of Turkey and north of Egypt, and for somehow, we're not even told exactly how, he hears about Jesus, he becomes a believer in Jesus, and he becomes part of the church there in Jerusalem. And he's first mentioned for his generosity. You know, there's often a journey that the Christian faith goes on. It starts with ideas understanding, belief in our head, that idea that, hey, well, maybe I should check this out and there's a, a truth here and maybe I should commit myself to that. And then it often moves to the heart where there's that deep emotional connection with Jesus, that willingness to, to follow and to be devoted to him. And then last of all, it moves to the pocketbook. And sometimes it gets stuck along the way. But Barnabas exemplifies that. He comes from faith to commitment to supporting the work with the poor people in the church in Jerusalem. These are people that have probably lost a lot by putting their faith in Jesus. It's not a popular thing to do in their day, and so he's willing to do his part to help them out. It's a good start on the Christian journey, but there's a whole lot more. So let's pick up the story again in Acts chapter 9, verses 26 and 27. When he had come to Jerusalem... He attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and described to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. 
Now the he in that passage is none other than the apostle Paul. Saul, who was a persecutor of the church, who was on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians, to have them thrown into jail or maybe even executed, and met Jesus along the way. And then when he comes to Jerusalem, the apostles aren't sure about this guy. I mean, okay, maybe he's really been converted or maybe he's just being a spy. Maybe he's trying to infiltrate the movement in order to arrest people and find out who's in charge. And it's Barnabas who steps forward and says, we can trust him. And you think about this. Barnabas is staking not only his reputation, but possibly his life on the fact that Paul really has been changed from the inside out by Jesus. That Paul really has had that transformation and has seen the light. It's not a safe thing to do in many ways. It fits with his personality of encouraging and often encouraging people means connecting this person with this person because they have something that they can be blessed by and having that relationship, that connection. And Barnabas takes the risk. Being a Christian can be a very risky endeavor sometimes. There is a lot of opposition to serving Jesus Christ. It's not a safe journey. Sometimes it's just words that are said that hurt that are in relationship to being a Christian, but sometimes there's actions that are taken that people do everything from boycott to actively attacking and persecuting Christians. I knew a fellow that worked for one of these international parachurch agencies, and one of the things that they did was smuggle Bibles into Saudi Arabia, where it's illegal to even have one. It's illegal to wear a cross in the country. It's so controlled by the Muslim majority that no other religion is allowed to promote anything, and they would smuggle Bibles into this closed society because the Word of God had the power to convert people even just from reading it. And they often use Filipino guest workers, people who could make a whole lot more money in the Saudi Arabia working there, and so they would go and work and send money back home, but they were strong Christians, and they would take every opportunity to share Bibles. And some were arrested, and some were tortured, and some were thrown into prison, and they would be kicked out and wouldn't be able to continue there if it's found out, but they were willing to take the risk for Jesus Christ. Jesus said, what would a man give? What would a person give to have eternal life. What's it worth compared to the earthly things that are passing away today? Let's pick up the story again in Acts 11, verses 22 to 26. News of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he rejoiced, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast devotion, For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were brought to the Lord. As Barnabas' walk with Jesus continues, his reputation with the disciples, with the leaders of the church, the apostles, grows and grows. And he is the person that they choose to go check out what's happening in Antioch. Remember the Faith starts with a bunch of Jewish followers of Jesus, and it first spreads only in Jewish areas, and then eventually God kind of has to push them out to share with the Gentiles, the non-Jews, and then they hear, hey, there's a church that sprung up in Antioch, and it's all these non-Jewish Greek-speaking people. So they send Barnabas to see if they really are Christians if they're really focused upon the truth, if they're really sharing the apostles' teaching, they give him a task of responsibility, and he goes and he checks them out, and he finds out, yes, God is at work there. The wagon train is growing. There are more on the journey. There are people committing themselves to that there and finding God at work in Antioch. Barnabas does what a Christian does and joins in the work becomes a part of that ministry. Not only that, but he says, you know, I bet I know who would be helpful here. That's Saul that met Jesus on the way to Damascus. 
And he goes to Saul's hometown of Tarsus, and he looks him up, and he brings him back in order to help do the work. Now, you have to understand, Antioch was one of the biggest cities in the Roman Empire. It was a huge place in the eastern part of the empire there. It was a crossroads. There was a lot of commerce. It's in what's now Syria. And this was an opportunity to really connect with that whole area. And so Barnabas and Saul start the work there. And Barnabas is described to us as a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. In other words, he's growing in his faith. He's maturing. He's becoming more and more responsible. People are recognizing that God is at work. See, ministry is not supposed to be an ego trip. It's not about us. It's not about our, our titles or our, our feel-good things. It's about doing the responsible work and glorifying God. And you know how the Bible says God responds when we are responsible about our devotion to him? He gives us more responsibility. He gives us a bigger task to do, more important things to be a part of. You remember that parable that Jesus told about the three guys that are given a certain amount of money or talents, and the first two invest it, they take risks, they use it, and it grows, and they are praised by their master. The third person takes it and hides it and says, here's what you gave me back. I was afraid to do anything else because I didn't want to take a risk of losing it. And that person's talent is taken away and given to somebody that has responsibility. It's about using the talents that were given. You know, they've done studies on people that live to be 100 plus. And there are certain areas in the world that have a lot of these centenarians. And one of the most important things that they've discovered about their life compared to other people's lives is how active they stay. They continue to use their body as much as possible. They continue to use their mind. Not only that, they continue to have a focus, a purpose, something that is important for them to get up for every morning and go out and do. Now, is it surprising that that's true spiritually as well? It's that kind of use it or lose it aspect with spirituality. You guys remember Zig Ziglar? The, the positive thinking success guy, I mean, with a name like Zig Ziglar, you've got to have a, have, have a ministry, right? And one of the things that he was really big on is saying successful people are people that take risks and do things. They try, they put in effort. Sometimes they fail, but they keep on trying. And Barnabas, he's, he's looking for ways to serve. And when he gets a, a, a responsibility, he takes it seriously. And not only that, he makes that connection again. He encourages again. He brings in Saul for the work that's there, which is going to be a stepping stone then to the most important thing that Barnabas ends up doing. So let's look again, beginning Acts 13, verses 1 through 4. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, a childhood friend of Herod the ruler, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and prayer, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they went to Cyprus. Barnabas becomes a full-fledged Christian missionary. He and Saul are chosen to lead this mission that the whole church will support and be a part of it. His leadership is recognized. His reputation grows more. If we had read some of the verses between this chapter and the last one, we would have found out that when they take up a special collection to help out the poor Christians in Judea, he and Saul, or Paul, are responsible people, and they choose for them to take the money to Jerusalem, something that you've got to really trust that they would actually do. And then when it's time for them to go out into the Gentile world with a mission, it says God through the Spirit indicates it's Barnabas and Saul that are supposed to do it. Now, you know, we know Paul as the great missionary leader of the New Testament, but the first mission, he is the assistant 
for Barnabas. Barnabas is the one who's really in charge as you continue to read through that. He has been found trustworthy, full of the Spirit, and God calls him to take that message abroad. And I'm sure, and if you read these chapters that follow, you know it was a difficult mission. They were attacked, they were misunderstood, they were kicked out of towns, and every time they got up and dusted themselves off and went to the next place. Not only did they go to places up north around that area of what's now northern Syria, eastern Turkey, but Barnabas goes back to his home island, back to Cyprus and takes the gospel there. You know, sometimes the hardest place to witness is with your hometown, your family, the people that know you since you were out that big, because they remember maybe what an ornery kid you were, or maybe they remember that you used to ring the church bell at the Methodist church and run away when the police came as a teenager. Stuff like that. And Barnabas takes the gospel back to where he is from. There's ups and downs. When it's time to go back and visit the churches they've started and continue with their mission works, Barnabas and Saul get in an argument. And they both go their separate ways. Paul takes Luke and others and goes his way. And, and, and from that point on, Barnabas kind of disappears from the story. Luke is focused on Paul's mission. He's with Paul at times directly. And we don't hear anything else. We don't know what happened to him. There's some church traditions, but there's no direct evidence of that. But he has done his part in so many ways. He has done that journey, and I'm sure the journey continued on, and I'm sure until he left this earth, he witnessed to Jesus Christ. We don't know how he got there, but we know his destination is in the kingdom of his Lord. And he provides an incredible example for us of somebody who starts on the journey and just continues to grow in work and reputation and devotion and his connection. He gives back and he grows and he gathers with the saints together and he continues that journey of following Jesus Christ. Christ and has that missionary journey that has such an impact upon the church. The Christian walk is meant to be an adventure. It's meant to try us and to push us. It's meant to help us to get to know the God that we will spend eternity with and the people that are fellow travelers along the way. It's meant to bring out the best in us. We are following a fellow that laid his life down for us. A fellow that told us that suffering can be a part of the journey. In fact, he told us life in this world is going to be rough, but we know our destination. And we know whom we follow and that we can trust him. And we know that he has the power to get us through no matter what we run into on the way. It starts with that willingness to give your heart to Christ, to trust in him, to hear those words that he speaks again and again in the gospel. Follow me. Come. Be my disciple. Be my follower. We don't know what the challenges and adventures might be, but we know those who gain life, who gain eternal life, are those who are willing to lay their life down for their Lord Jesus Christ. Those who are willing to take up their cross daily and follow him. I remember as a teenager thinking, you know, I know that this is true and I know I should believe and I know I should follow Jesus, but I'm going to give up on so much fun in life if I do this Christian stuff. And I found out that that was the complete opposite. That what I thought was fun as a teenager and sometimes even as an adult is a temptation is destructive stuff. And if you really want adventure, follow Jesus. He will put you in places that require the best of you, that mean you have to give the best, that are difficult, that are hard, that are trying, and yet he's always with you. And he walks beside you and he empowers you to get there. And it ends at the pearly gates in God's kingdom. Because Jesus has the power to get us through the journey, to get us through the ups and downs. 
We also find along the way that those that are trustworthy with a little, as Jesus said, will be given much. Those who are responsible with what little they've been given will be blessed with more. More responsibility, higher role, more importance in the kingdom. Those willing to follow the Lord give the power to help lead others in that right direction too. And to share the incredible gift of eternal life with people. You know, you're the kind of folks that if you saw somebody in trouble, you would stop and help them out. If you saw somebody choking, you'd, you'd do something to save their life. Or if you had to help somebody that was having a heart attack, you'd do that. This is an opportunity to give people eternal life by sharing with them what Jesus Christ has done for us. So Barnabas is a picture of the growing disciple of Jesus Christ. The person that is devoted to following. That goes where he's sent, that's open to what God leads him to, that continues to mature as the Spirit shapes him. He continues to move. Now here's the kicker, folks. You can't be a follower of Jesus and be a couch potato at the same time. Christianity is not a spectator sport. It's participatory. I heard a guy talking about, you know, this is football season, and I'm a college football fan especially, and talked about, you know, the typical football game is 22 people out there on the field running themselves crazy, terribly overworked and tired, surrounded by 60 to 80,000 people, desperately in need of exercise, who are sitting there eating and watching them. That's a spectator sport, right? We can't just sit in the pews and live out our calling to follow Jesus. You can't be stuck and follow Jesus Christ. He keeps moving. He keeps pushing us. He keeps encouraging us. He keeps telling us there's more. There's more. Come, follow me. Come see what it is. Come, be on the adventure. Come, Learn what it's like to experience the grace of God that allows you to do things and get through things that you could never deal with on your own power. That incredible victory that comes from following Jesus. And we have incredible examples. People like Barnabas who show us what it's, mean, what it's like to give your life and your heart to following him. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, help us to be your disciples. Help us to be those that encourage and grow and gather and give and all the things that you call us to do. Help us to be open to all that you have for us, never to settle for less than all that you have for us. And help us to be those people that are able to look back at our life and be surprised at how far you have brought us how much you have changed us from the inside out, how you have taken an old lump of coal and turned us into a diamond, Lord. Thank you for your spirit at work with us and help us to always be open and willing to cooperate as we follow you. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We come to a time of response, and this is an opportunity for us to respond to the call of God. We remember our tithes and offerings, the way that we give and support. Barnabas was an example of that giving, and there's so many in Christian history who take those words that Paul reminds us about Jesus and test them out and find that they're true, that it's better to give than to receive. There is a joy in being able to make a difference in somebody's life. There's a joy in making an impact in the world for good. And we thank you for your faithful giving. Most of it we do electronically. We do have a little box over there. This is also a time to go to the Lord in prayer for our daily walks, for our needs, for our struggles. Uh, then after I pray, we're going to have an opportunity for you to have individual prayer with me or with our other prayer leaders that will be available for that. And I want to talk about one more response today. This is a little bit different in that 
we're taking a step of faith next week because we're going to kick off a new worship time and a new worship service. We're going to be upstairs after this service at 1030, and this is going to be a traditional service. It's going to be not just two different times that you can kind of plug into worship, but two different styles of worship. Uh, and we, we want everybody to pray for that. Uh, we, we're asking for a select group to kind of commit themselves to attending. I mean, you could attend both services. We're not asking anybody to, to move to a different service unless you feel like God is asking you to do that. But we want to have kind of a core to start that as we continue to reach out and ask people to support that and not see that as a threat in some ways, which sometimes church people do, because we will all still be a part of this body and we will have opportunities to connect across the services, but also to share with people. For those folks that like to sleep in a little bit later, hey, we've got another option for you. For those folks that like a more traditional worship, hey, here's an opportunity for you to connect with either one. And, and knowing our worship folks, we're going to have quality music at both of those services. And it's going to be an opportunity, we hope, to reach people that maybe we weren't able to reach before. So I appreciate your prayers, your commitment, your sharing, those opportunities to let people know God is working here. Come and get connected. Come and be a part of that. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love. We thank you that you have proven your love by sending Jesus Christ to die for us while we were in rebellion against you, while we were fighting you and pushing you away. And sometimes, Lord, we still fight you and push you away. And Lord, help us to learn that the victory comes in surrendering to you, to your will, to responding to you, to accepting that grace that forgives us and gives us the power to forgive ourselves and to forgive other people to accept that power that starts from within and allows us to be transformed by your Holy Spirit, to accept that role of taking on the name of Jesus Christ and following him. Father, we need your guidance. We need your care. We need your strength. And sometimes we need you to woo us and direct us as we seek to live out the calling of Jesus, to share the gospel with those that need that hope that comes only through him to minister to those that are hurting in the name of Jesus, to grow in our Christian walk and to love one another as you would have us to, Lord, to worship you in spirit and truth and be good stewards of all that you have given us, time and talents and money and all the different things. And Father, we need you in our lives and our families because we're all still in the midst of the struggle here. We pray for those that are dealing with grief, that have experienced losses, and I know there are some here that have had so many losses this year, Lord. We pray that you would be there to comfort, to provide hope. We pray for those that are struggling with medical issues, bodily illness of whatever type. We pray for your healing presence, for your provision for those that are struggling or afraid of financial issues and dealing with trouble there, for your direction in life when big decisions need to be made. Father, for your strength and ability to Reconcile us with those that are sometimes close to us, and yet we have broken relationships or strained relationships with them, Lord. And Father, to forgive us. We all fail at times, and we need your grace at work in our hearts and our lives. We need the strength and the power to break free from those things that would entangle us and destroy us. Help us to be your people in action as well as in name, Lord. We pray for our nation our leaders, our servicemen and women. We pray that you would be at work in our schools and our communities. We pray that you would keep our children safe, Lord, and that you would bless our preschool and our mom co-group and all the different ministries with children and youth. We pray for confirmation class, that this would be a special time for our young people to grow in their understanding and their willingness to follow. We pray that you would be at work in each one of our families and lives. And we honor you and praise you and give you glory. Be with your church throughout the world. Be with the people of your holy land, Lord. Be with us. And may we feel your presence strong for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, if you need prayer, we've got folks that are stationed around the room for that. And I'm willing to come and pray with you as well. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on a level path. Psalm 143, verse 10. I'm 
so confused I know I heard you loud and clear So I followed through Somehow I ended up here I don't want to think I may never understand That my broken heart is part of your plan When I try to pray God is heard and these four words Thy will be done Thy will be done Thy will be done I know you're good don't feel good right now and I know you think of things I could never think about it's hard to count it all joy distracted by the noise just trying to make sense of all your promises sometimes I gotta stop remember that you're prayers. Thank you for being at work in our lives. May your will be done in them. In Jesus' name. Amen. I made myself a slave to all so that I might win more of them. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 19.
you sold out to Jesus yet? Have you? Have you given your life wholly to him? And not just accept him as your savior, but as your Lord? The one you follow? The one you're obedient to? God, thank you for this time with you. Thank you that you have promised that wherever two or three of us gather together in your name, that you are present with us and we feel your spirit among us. Lord, watch over us, guide us, help us to be open to all that you have for us this week, that we might serve you and glorify you, that we might experience your blessing, that we might use our freedom to lift high Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.